clearly established that there are some significant negative effects on those calves when they experience heat stress in utero, both early in life, so we can reduce their growth, and perhaps more important, we can reduce their passive transfer, so those calves are less likely to stay in the herd for an extended period of time if they experience heat stress in utero. Uh, But then when they mature and they actually move into the production string, those animals are going to have a drag from that heat stress in utero. So they produce less milk in their first, in their second, in their third lactation. I expect it would be the fourth lactation too if we were keeping records that far out. Uh, But those animals are definitely going to be more inclined to a low productivity phenotype. They're a lower health phenotype, and it's actually expressed as a lower survival phenotype. Welcome to the Dairy Health Black Belt Podcast. I'm Dr. Luciano Cacheta, Assistant Prof- Associate Professor at the University of Minnesota. And this is the podcast that's brought to you by Wisenetics and the podcast that will discuss all the hot topics in the dairy health uh, realm these days. So today we have the pleasure to have Dr. Jeff Dow uh, as a, a, our uh, guest today. and. His name and many of us have seen a lot of his work uh, in the area of heat stress and it's his group has been very prolific and out of his group there's a there's a lot of like new groups that came from the people that graduated with him and like the topic is very uh, active and all those people are very active so uh, welcome to the podcast Dr. Gal. Thanks Luciano appreciate it. Like I said like he, your name, like we talk about heat stress and your name comes to mind. Like it's, it's very, it's rare or it, sh- it shouldn't happen that we have a discussion, heat stress and your name, it's not uh, a present. So there is, like I said, there's a lot of papers that came out and a lot of work that have been done in your group and then came out and it's very enlightening and helping the industry. So with that in mind, I think if we narrow down a little bit, it, it helps because it's a very broad area. But like, what? Like, let's talk about a little bit about the in utero effect of this heat stress on dairy calves and the cows as they grow up. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, a lot of our work the, started with the dry cows and the impact the heat stress in the dry cow. But of course, it's not just the cow that's affected. We've, uh, I think, pretty clearly established that there are some significant negative effects on those calves when they experience heat stress in utero, both early in life, so we can reduce their growth, and perhaps more important, we can reduce their passive transfer, so those calves are less likely to stay in the herd for an extended period of time if they experience heat stress in utero. Uh, But then when they mature and they actually move into the production string, those animals are going to have a drag from that heat stress in utero. So they produce less milk in their first, in their second, in their third lactation. I expect it would be the fourth lactation too if we were keeping records that far out. Uh, But those animals are definitely going to be more inclined to a low productivity phenotype. They're a lower health phenotype, and it's actually expressed as a lower survival phenotype. So those animals leave the herd usually about a year uh, less time in the herd if they've been heat stressed in utero. So no, uh, no positives to that. Wisenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads, we elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence, starting now. Yeah, you're, you're accumulating losses through their life, and you also like don't capture on an extra year of uh, potential milk. That's a huge loss for, for those animals. Exactly. And the other thing to remember, particularly when we're talking about it from a sort of practical standpoint, is that this is not extreme heat stress. It is what we would see typically in Florida more of the year than you would necessarily in Minnesota. But I can guarantee you that today in Minnesota, it is plenty hot. And so we have a significant period of time when dry cows could be affected during the summer. Uh, and we can't ignore them, even in our sort of northern climates where we might think heat stress doesn't last as long. 
you know, the other thing that I always remind people is that we have a higher proportion of our herd that's actually dry during the heat stress period, right? Because we don't have a lot of cows that are calving now. We have a lot of cows that are going to start calving in August. And it's also a consequence, right? Like we cannot get them pregnant, which then leads them to be calving. When exactly, exactly. So it's one of those things that, that builds on this. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, I know we're talking about the calves, but from a, from a production and practicality standpoint, what we've observed is that when we do a better job of cooling those dry cows, we can actually dampen that seasonal oscillation that we see and, you know, maybe reduce that heavy slug of cows that are calving in the fall. We won't eliminate it completely, but we can certainly sort of smooth that out. Definitely. Yeah. It's like, it's especially on a farm, you, you're shipping milk every day. So it's, it's not like, and this is what before my time here in the U S but like people were shipping more in the fall because it's cool year and all that, but that's not the case anymore. Definitely very important. And it's, I, I'm always appreciative of your work. Uh, when I'm teaching students, I always, go back to what you have done and showing, but it's one thing also as a practitioner, as a consultant, uh, is showing the importance of paying attention to our dry cows, right? Because like the, they were neglected for way too long. And then when we start looking at it, it's like, yeah, maybe a lot of the issues we have, we could have invest way, like a lot, lot less money and get them out of the woods and that. Yeah, this is uh, sort of the, uh, what I like to say is the poster child of an ounce of pre prevention is worth a pound of cure because we can prevent a lot of the problems that we see in early lactation if we do a better job with dry cow management. And that goes across the board from a management perspective, housing, comfort, nutrition, all of those things can really be impacted more effectively during the dry period than we can fix once those animals calve in. Perfect, yeah. And I always use the analogy for my vet students that us being a fire marshal, it's a much better approach than being a firefighter because the damage is done. We can put the fires out, but we're not recuperating any of that loss, right? Exactly, exactly. No, that's a, that's a great way to look at it. Yeah, and I have a, a, a you, you made a good segue on a point that you made, it's like there's prevention. Prevention, that's where we should be focusing. And you mentioned a little bit about nutrition. You also mentioned like, yes, if you have uh, heat abatement uh, strategies, definitely very important for the cows. But like in nutritional wise, your group also has some work with choline and choline supplementation. So can you expand on that and uh, give us more details on that? Yeah, that's a recent study that we've done looking at, you know, we're always trying to look for ways that we can improve uh, these animals' responses to heat stress. And so um, typically we think of choline as during the transition period, right, the late dry period and into lactation. We wanted to look at the impacts of choline throughout the dry period because of the potential to overcome some of the heat stress uh, effects that we see, particularly in the calves, uh, through its activity as a methyl donor. I mean, there, there's a number of different sort of uh, potential biological hypotheses for this, but we replaced choline just for the dry period when animals were heat stressed or not. And we didn't see much of an effect on the cows from a production standpoint. I think that may have been limited by the fact that we stopped at calving and we didn't continue it on for a few weeks, but that was the design of the study. Uh, but we did see some interesting outcomes in the calves and we're still putting this all together, but we see some specific organs that are influenced by that uh, replacement of choline or the additional choline that those animals got when they were heat stressed. Um, in particular, we see uh, heat stress is going to have a negative impact on the thymus, It's going to, which is an immune organ, obviously. It's going to have a negative impact on the ovaries. So ovarian development is, and we've shown that previously, uh, and it also has an impact on adrenal development. And the adrenal glands are obviously important for sort of stress responses and other things. And we were able to reverse some of those negative effects, particularly in adrenal development. So what we see is sort of a hypertrophy of the adrenal gland, particularly early in life, and that may have consequences later in terms of those animal stress responses. We saw that choline replacement to those cows, um, their calves then had some reversal of that impact. Well, that, that's super interesting. And this, this research is not as uh, 
has been going for as long as your previous one that we talked about the heat stress. So you probably don't have like multiple generations of uh, response on that yet, right? That's that's correct. And one of the limitations, of course, was this was a slaughter study. So <laughs> yeah, you're not gonna have it. We don't have any more generations of these animals. But we will be examining the impacts on ovarian development sort of to a much greater extent because what we've seen previously with heat stress is that those animals that have heat stress in utero, ovarian development is sort of held back. Uh, but also, remember, she's born with all the follicles she's ever going to produce. So it's affecting multiple generations. So we'll be looking at that in some of the tissues that we've collected from these calves. Yeah, but it's also interesting for the people that are using the, the strategy on the field like to be aware of this, right? Because they might be, now they can pay attention and capture that. They, again, association and not a causation, but like something to, to, to be aware of. Right, right. Good. So uh, definitely a uh, great conversation. Taking care of our dry cows, like I mentioned earlier, it's great heat abatement, and also nutrition uh, strategies to help not only the cows, but also the calves, which is something that this, how can, the calves are being influenced is something that it's also like, it's not that it's new, but it's something that lately, that's when we, could, we were able to actually measure it. So uh, I'm very, I, I'm glad to hear and see, and I'm always very interested in seeing all the work that's coming out of uh, your team. And like I said, out of the satellite teams that came out of your lab, which are many uh, in the country. All right. Thanks, Luciano. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, uh, listening to this one more podcast from us. If you like the podcast, uh, hit the button like, subscribe, send us feedback and other topics that we'd like to hear. And this is it for today. I'm Luciano Cacheta and this is the Dairy Health Black Belt, Black Belt Podcast. Thank you.